the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue but on principal cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched, and the person or things to be seized. In America, the Constitution specifically limits the scope of warrants. But why, since such warrants are to discover and eliminate criminal behavior? Why was limiting the scope of warrants, searches, and seizures so important that it was specifically included in the Bill of Rights? And what could any of this have to do with doxing? When our society discusses issues politely, with each side seeking a peaceful resolution, everyone benefits. When the discussion is a highly polarized shouting match between people who just don't listen to each other, well, it's time for some roasted opinions. I hate doxing. Absolutely loathe it. Don't give me any crap about the public has a right to know. Doxing is the nuclear option of internet debate. Some people feel that others commenting in the public space, i.e. on social media, have no reasonable expectation of privacy. Some even argue that remaining anonymous should not be permitted at all on social media because someone who is anonymous will say things that they wouldn't say if their name was attached. That's absolutely correct, and that's kind of the point of remaining anonymous. It's not cowardice to want to protect your family and friends from blowback from statements that you have made on the internet, nor is it cowardice to not risk your personal financial stability over somebody else getting pissed off because you offended them. Doxing someone is intended to silence them. It's a method of winning the debate through nefarious means. Doxing can be financially harmful and can even subject the doxed individual to violence. But what does doxing have to do with the Fourth Amendment? Time for a bit of a history lesson because this amendment grew directly out of the experiences of the colonists. There were two major issues during the colonial period which the kings of Great Britain wished to eliminate. Sedition and smuggling. Parliament had the ability to issue royal monopolies on the king's behalf, and they did this frequently. The treasury was often empty due to wars and extravagant spending by a series of kings throughout the history of England, and Parliament often borrowed the money which it needed from the Bank of England. The Bank of England in turn exercised significant influence on Parliament to grant exclusive trading rights to certain companies, like the British East India Company. Many members of the House of Lords were also stockholders in the Bank of England and the East India Company, so ensuring the survival and profitability of these organizations was in their personal interest. At the time, government derived from the House of Lords as well, not like it does today where the government arises from the House of Commons. Enter George III, who despite his reputation in America was generally a decent king. Upon his ascent to the throne, he inherited a treasury stuffed only with debtor's notes to the Bank of England, a punitively expensive war with France and its allies over colonial possessions across the world, and the crown lands, the intended source of income both to maintain the dignities of the royal household and to fund the king's government, so badly mismanaged that they provided no income to fund anything. George was a thrifty man, unlike many of his predecessors, and took steps both in his management of his private holdings and his government to pay off the debts and restore the financial health of England. All of the British colonies scattered across the world were either charter colonies belonging to private companies or crown colonies, part of the crown lands which were so unprofitable when George III became king. India was a charter colony and belonged to the East India Company. The American colonies at the time of George's coronation were crown lands and both George and Parliament needed for them to provide as much income as possible to finance the Seven Years' War, a truly global war fought on five different continents. Royal monopolies were issued to secure trade on commodities, which were then taxed to pay off the debts from the Seven Years' War and to finance the standing armies in the Crown Colonies. I know, I know, 
that's a lot of backstory. Teal deer smuggling hit merry old England right in the pocketbook, and there was a lot of smuggling in the American colonies. The British Crown declared that all trade with the American colonies must pass through British ships, so that British customs and duties could be assessed on those cargoes. But the Americans liked to do business with the French as well, who often called upon the ports on the eastern seaboard, such as Boston and New York. French goods, because they did not have English duties and customs attached to them, were often cheaper. British common law also included strong provisions against sedition, an unfortunate product of the restoration of Charles II after the English Civil War. Parliament had the duty to protect the king against high treason, and part of that protection which they provided was to suppress the publishing of documents critical of the Crown and Parliament by anyone but members of Parliament. Such publications were considered seditious libel. The government searched for such documents whenever they discovered their publication to remove them from circulation. When Thomas Paine published Common Sense, he committed exactly this offense, and he wasn't the only American publishing such pamphlets. In short, Crown governors were specifically empowered and tasked with searching for smuggled goods and seditious papers, and for this they had writs of assistance. Writs of assistance are documents that permit the search of any person or property without probable cause and to seize any goods suspected of being smuggled or suspicious papers. The writ of assistance also authorized the arrest of anyone for smuggling or sedition without further evidence than their possession of these items. Further, writs of assistance remained in force for the lifetime of the sovereign plus six months once issued. Writs of assistance issued when George III took the throne in 1760 remained in force until six months after he died in 1820. The Townshend Acts of 1767 reinforced the right of Parliament to issue general writs of assistance without specific cause, which they used against merchants in Boston especially. By now, I guess you'd see why this was an important issue for Americans at the time. When the Constitution was ratified, the framers made specific provisions regarding warrants to protect the rights of private citizens. The Fourth Amendment bars the use of general warrants entirely. Only specific causes may be used as evidence to get a warrant, and all warrants in the United States are limited in scope. If a warrant grants permission to search a business, a second warrant must be obtained to search a private home, even if evidence discovered during the search of the business indicates that criminal activity has occurred at the home. Arrest warrants must name specific individuals, not groups. Seizure warrants must name specific property as well. If, for instance, John is visiting his brother Jake when the local authorities execute a search warrant on Jake's house, John's vehicle is secure from search until the authorities produce a search warrant for that vehicle, with a few common sense caveats like evidence of a crime lying in plain sight. While Jake's house is being searched, Jake and John are both safe from search of their persons unless a warrant specifies otherwise. To some, this might seem cumbersome. In fact, it is a big part of the basis for the right to privacy, together with the First, Third, and Fifth Amendments. Without just cause, no one may violate your privacy in America, not the government, not private citizens, and not even journalists. There is one caveat to that right to privacy, though, status as a public figure. The media has a right to publish private information obtained about public figures within reason because of free speech and because the public has a right to know if public figures, especially elected officials, are engaging in misconduct. There are limits even to this, though. More than a few media outlets have been successfully sued for violating the privacy of celebrities. Privacy violation lawsuits are a common response to the publication of embarrassing or misleading information. This is the legal principle behind defamation lawsuits. Whew, lad. That's a lot of stuff coming out of such a short amendment. So I have an absolute right to privacy then? Um, no. Just, no. Right to privacy does not protect you from criminal prosecution or civil lawsuits. Hidden evidence obtained without a proper warrant is inadmissible. But if the warrant was lawful, or if the evidence was in plain view, then it may not be excluded. What one says or does in public is not their private information anymore. It can be argued, and often is by media outlets, that the public has the right to know otherwise private information that becomes public. 
especially if it reveals that a public figure has engaged in unacceptable behavior. The protections against unlawful seizures don't prevent the collection of evidence, nor do they prevent the seizure of property specific to a court order. Together with the Third Amendment, the government cannot seize private property without just compensation, but it can seize evidence of a crime, and it can seize private property in order to pay off fines and civil judgments. That's why it's still legal to foreclose mortgage properties, seize them for unpaid taxes, and order the sale of property under bankruptcy provisions. Doxing is a particularly heinous violation of privacy because a dox normally contains previously self-released information. Doxing blurs the line between the right to privacy and the right of reporting information on public figures. Honestly, nearly every dox is intended to suppress free speech through intimidation and defamation. It may not be specifically illegal to dox, and I did a lot of searching through the law to confirm this. But doxing may be illegal if it is part of another crime, such as extortion or incitement to violence. Even if it's not illegal, doxing is still morally and ethically bankrupt behavior, and without a compelling reason like a criminal investigation, it should not happen. I know that everyone knows that doxing is bad. Not everyone knows that doxing violates the same natural rights that unlawful searches and seizures do. Maybe some folks should get some federal laws passed specifically against doxing. Maybe as part of an internet bill of rights. Now that's just my opinion and you don't have to agree with me. In fact, I'd love to hear what you think so go ahead and give me a like or dislike and comment below. If you like this content and want to see more, feel free to subscribe and make sure that you ring the notification bell. New episodes of Roasted Opinions post on Wednesdays and Saturdays at 8 p.m. Central Time. Join me on the last Saturday of every month for my special episode, In the Kitchen. New content is coming, so watch this space.